Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's, one of you, it's wonderful to be here today. My name is Billy Lau. I am a research scientist from Georgia Institute of Technology. Um, today, together with my colleagues, uh, Yongjing Zhang and Cheng Yu Song, uh, we are going to be presenting our work entitled Mactons Injecting Malware into iOS Devices via Malicious Chargers. So Mactons is basically uh, encapsulates a, a small portion of our findings in a larger security research uh, in mo mobiles, uh, mobile security research that is done in Georgia Tech Information Security Center, uh, better known as GTIS. So why don't we get started? Um, the, here is the agenda for today. Basically, the talk will be partitioned into three sections, uh, beginning with the uh, iOS security. In this section, I will talk about the overview of iOS security and uh, a deeper analysis of what it is. And then we will go into the introduction of Mactons, that is a proof of concept attack that we've developed, which um, allows us to basically install these malicious applications. And then we'll end with discussions uh, beginning from the observations that we've made during the process of research and also the uh, potential countermeasures that we have proposed and also what we have seen implemented, uh, uh, what countermeasures that we have seen implemented uh, in the newest release of uh, iOS 7 beta. So now uh, to begin, uh, let's start with the I overview of an iOS security. Now um, before I go further, um, let me guess uh, started with a few terms that I'll be using throughout. So I'll be using, number one, the term apps uh, to refer to applications, uh, programs that users install on their um, iPhones or iDevices. And as I mentioned, iDevices, I will, I will be using this term instead of uh, particularly um, iPhones or iPad because it's a more general term. Now in the research of iOS security, um, we deal with a lot of assumptions and basically challenging these assumptions as we find them. And here the question today is how secure are uh, iOS devices? And how do we relate these assumptions to uh, everyday user? In particular, um, like activities like um, answering the phones, uh, making calls or sending SMSs to very mundane activities like uh, even charging their phones, which every user must do, we presume. And then uh, we raise the question of are there ways to basically challenge this security assumption uh, besides jailbreaking the devices? So I want to, you to uh, keep in mind these questions and hopefully you'll find uh, the answers to these uh, by the end of uh, these questions by the end of our talk. So we begin our analysis from the uh, Apple App Store. The Apple App Store uh, in a nutshell is a very critical piece in this whole ecosystem on iOS security. And the reason is that it helps Apple to enforce this uh, model called the World Garden Model. Basically, what this model means is that uh, no arbitrary person should be able to install arbitrary app on any arbitrary I device. So in this context, Apple App Store is very important from the developer's point of view. It is the platform, the only platform to publish apps. And from the user's point of view, it is the only place to purchase or download apps. Now, needless to say, this Apple App Store is completely owned and controlled by Apple. Therefore, the integrity during the app review process uh, should not come as a question. Now, all apps that are submitted must be reviewed by Apple prior to release. Uh, but the caveat is that even though the app may have gone through an initial release uh, approved for release, it could still be removed from the store retroactively should Apple find uh, this app to violate its policy sometime in the future. Now with this, uh, we raise another question. The question is then how does Apple enforce this policy that no arbitrary person should be able to download an arbitrary app and run it? What if me as a user, I want to uh, download an app and run it? Uh, the simple answer to that is through something called uh, the mandatory code signing process. Basically, the code signing process enforces the integrity all the way from the hardware, uh, the, the device itself, to uh, going up in uh, 
in, in the software stack uh, to the bootloader, the operating systems, and eventually the apps. Um, basically, so this means that only apps that are, uh, have dig correct digital signature can be installed and executed on iDevices. Who can, now the question, who can sign this apps? Uh, no doubt, of course, only Apple can sign this. But um, during our uh, process of research, we discover that there is a potential channel which uh, can be exploited. And this is the other entity that, uh, who can actually sign uh, apps is the iOS developers themselves. Now, then who can become iOS developers? Again, uh, during our process, uh, research process, uh, what we did was we go to the um, Apple's development portal uh, and uh, request to be developers. We submit our credentials, names, address, and credit card numbers, and we will be billed, uh, I think it's $99, and then um, a few hours after that, we approve, and voila, uh, I'm already an iOS developer. So this, what this means as, as a consequence is that now I am able to uh, sign any arbitrary app and then run arbitrary app on any iDevice. So I want you to first keep in mind of this point as we continue to review the uh, Apple World Garden model. So uh, conventionally, uh, when a developer is done developing his app, he will submit it to the App Store and go through a, a review process. During this review process, uh, Apple will attempt to uh, determine whether or not this app uh, pass or fail based on many, many criteria, uh, uh, rules and regulations. Uh, naturally, the question is what are then, what then are the rules? Unfortunately, although there is an of official uh, list that Apple publishes on guidelines that what constitutes a, a good or approved apps, it is uh, completely open for interpretation and at uh, Apple's discretion. So, uh, the best we can do is to examine, uh, based on our experience, uh, apps that has been previously banned or rejected from the App Store. And what we found out is that uh, apps that make use of private APIs are rejected and banned. And also, these rules are probably changing very regularly. Uh, in a more uh, technical sense, what happens during the app review is uh, we think uh, Apple deploys static analysis to check uh, whether or not these uh, private APIs are called uh, in, your, in your app, and also deploy some manual testing where a real user uh, installs this device during the uh, review process and actually clicks through. And uh, through a very empirical, uh, empirical process, then they uh, will approve or reject the app. Now having that said, if your app managed to pass the review process, your app is now uh, being submitted, uh, can be published through the App Store. Uh, any user then can um, go to the App Store by launching the App Store app from his or her iDevice and then search for the associated app that he wants. However, after installation during the execution, uh, the app that is installed is still confined in some way and this confinement is uh, called the iOS sandbox. Basically, the iOS sandbox provides two types of isolation. Number one, process isolation. Number two, file system isolation. So what is process isolation? Uh, process isolation is when, um, for example, uh, a particular app A cannot read, uh, is not allowed to read any other app's uh, memory region. And it also cannot uh, talk to any other process using the tra traditional IPC-like APIs. So as you can see, this way, uh, the communications, intercommunications between app is very limited. And as for file system isolation, what this, the protection it brings is that uh, if I have app A installs a particular, f uh, sorry, uh, saves a particular file onto a disk. Uh, any other app on the, uh, installed on the iDevice cannot read, or it doesn't even know about the existence of this um, file. Now, uh, there is some caveat. Although there is a uh, certain region uh, in the iOS file system that is public, is publicly readable, but it is um, strictly read only. This means that um, no modifications, therefore uh, there does not exist communication channel. 
So from the standpoint of the iOS sandbox, it provides a protection where um, even an, uh, an app that is installed uh, cannot easily attack another app on the system. So this is in, in contrary to traditional platforms like PCs where um, such attacks can happen more easily. And there's uh, another interesting uh, aspect of uh, iOS runtime in the sandbox is that uh, iOS runtime performs uh, entitlement check. So what is uh, what are entitlements? You can view entitlements as um, special privileges or permissions to access certain sensitive resources. In this context, uh, examples of entitlements are uh, like access to, if your app, app wants access to iCloud, if your app wants to do push notification or uh, change passcode. Um, so iOS strictly enforces this app entitlement during runtime. If you do not have this declared and approved, you don't have such entitlement. <clears throat> so with this knowledge in mind now, um, we are ready to uh, go back to the question we posed earlier on the effectiveness of uh, Apple's wall garden model. So now, the wall garden model is assumed to be secure because all apps are carefully vetted uh, before it has been released and downloaded, and therefore it is safe, right? Uh, and to its credit, uh, compared to Android, there really is almost no in the wild malware instances for iOS that we know of. <clears throat> However, do, do keep in mind uh, that about the additional channel that I've mentioned just now, wh where it is, where I talk about the iOS developers. This basically creates a channel for iOS developers to sideload uh, any uh, apps onto the iDevice. And this is exactly uh, what the idea of backends is about. And now I shall guide you through step by step introductions to backends. Basically, Macton's, uh challenges the very fundamental assumptions that uh, security assumptions that people make when they are performing their day-to-day -day tasks. In particular, um, charging the devices and uh, using the devices when it is being charged, um, because Macton's, uh exactly leverages this uh, to basically um, t exploit the weaknesses that we find in order to then install arbitrary malicious apps. So conceptually, uh, let's answer a few questions of uh, what Mactens is and what Mactens is not. So I must really emphasize, Mactens, what makes Mactens unique is that uh, it is, firstly, it is not a jailbreak. It does not require the target device to be jailbroken before Mactens attack can happen. Neither does it cause the phone to be jailbroken after Macton's at, uh, attack has happened. And the attack is very automatic. Uh, sim simply By simply connecting the device uh, to the Macton's charger, the attack is done. And during the attack, during the Macton's attack, uh, it's very stealthy. Basically, if the user were to even look at a screen, um, there's no vis visible cues that uh, something suspicious is going on. Excuse me. Uh, last but not least, uh, Mactens uh, delivers a very powerful attack because unlike a uh, conventional, traditional uh, way of uh, downloading an app from the App Store, Mactens can, the arbitrary apps that Mactens uh, installs onto the target device can really does malicious things that other apps cannot do. And we shall all see this uh, in, in a short video demo uh, throughout this talk later. So with this concept, we have uh, basically implemented a prototype uh, with a Beagle board, as you can see here uh, on the screen. Um, we've chosen the Beagle board largely because it is simply that because it is open source and it is commercially available. So this shows that uh, such an attack uh, has really has very low uh, barrier, low entry uh, barrier. And uh, as you can see there, um, BeagleBoard comes with a USB port, which will then becomes the interface to plug in the uh, USB to uh, Lightning um, 
cable, and then user will use it to charge the device. Um, now for a moment, uh, you may think that this does not look at all like uh, the Apple's uh, original charger. But this is, um, I would say that please do not be fixated with the form because as you can see here, there's so many other forms of uh, basically mini computers that ca can be so much smaller. In fact, today's, with today's technology, the system on chip technology, uh, uh, we can fabricate um, chips with processing, um, x86 processing powers with the size of only, uh, uh, the size of the tip of your finger, uh, index finger. So really, size is not a matter. We, uh, we just chose that because of a short uh, time constraint and small financial budget. Now with that in mind, um, let me first guide you through a high level overview of what happens when uh, a user has connected his or her device onto a Macton's charger. So number one, uh, Macton's will um, immediately obtain a device UDID. With the device UDID, it will then uh, generate a appropriate provisioning profile. Then it waits for an opportunity to pair with the device. Once the pairing is done, it will then install the generated provisioning profile. One, after the provisioning profile has been successfully um, installed, then Maxons can install arbitrary malicious app that it wants. So now um, to cover this terms I mentioned, UDID, provisioning profile, and so on. Uh, my colleague, Yon Jing, will take over um, to go into further details. Uh, hello, audiences. Uh, my name is Yong Jin Jang, and I will talk about the technical details of the Mactens attack. And the first step of the Mactens attack is the getting UDID. UDID, as it stands for Universal Device Identifier, it is a unique identifier for distinguishing an uh, iDevices. And Apple uses this UDID for registering a device to a certain developer's license for a development purpose. So it is quite sensitive information because the, if anyone can get this one, then the, he can register someone's device for a development device. But however, the obtaining of the UDID is quite trivial. Uh, we don't know the reason, but uh, Apple exposed this UDID as a USB serial number. So right after the connecting with the USB cable, it is automatically sent to the USB host as a USB descri uh, device description header. So that anyone can get this number by connecting it and just typing LS USB. It will print out the UDID. And next step is uh, pair with the device. Uh, to interact with the iDevice through the USB connection, the Mactens uh, re is required to be paired with the device. So once it is connected, Mactens will try to pair with it. And this pairing step is for exchanging session key, which is used for encrypting the further communication. And on this pairing, we leverage two weaknesses. Uh, one thing is, on this pairing, the iDevices do not do any authentication of the USB host that initiates this pairing. So if the devices are available for the pairing, then the, any USB host initiates the pairing, then they cannot reject it. And also it does not ask for the user's permission or it does not giving the, any visual indication for this pairing. And, but uh, there's one protection mechanism for this pairing. And uh, that is, the pairing can, be, can only be done when the device is passcode unlocked. But uh, every de I devices are shipped with the, uh, without the passcode in default. In that case, if it is connected with the Mactens, then it will be automatically paired and Macten can launch the attack. Or for a more general case, if the device is set with the passcode, then if that device is passcode unlocked and connect with the, connected with the Mactens, then it will be automatically paired. Or it is connected while it is locked, but the user unlocks it for the re replying for the SMS or replying for the Facebook message, then it will be automatically paired. So the another weakness is, comes in at this stage. Once it is paired, the connection will remain permanently 
and that can be used whether or not the device is locked. So if Mactens can get any moment of pairing while it is charging, then the pairing is done and Mactens can launch the attack. So for this, for preventing the Mactens attack, the only way is to, before the charging, to keep the devices locked and plug it and the, put the device locked entire of the time of the charging. Then Mactens cannot do the pairing, then it will not do the attack. After the pairing, Mactens can do anything that can be done through the USB connection. And simply, it is uh, what the iTunes or Xcode can do. So for example, Mactens can do the get some device information or install and removing apps and provisioning profiles and backup and restore or we can also do the debugging. But for Mactens attack, we specifically exploit the second feature install and removing apps and provisioning profile to inject our own side code, own signed code to the device. And next is a description of the, the provisioning profile. So in the iOS framework, there are some entities who requires execution on the device, execution of their code on the device without Apple's involvement. They are individual developer, developers or some enterprise who has the proprietary application and who wants the in-house distribution. And to allow them to run the code on the device, Apple introduced this provisioning profile. And to get this provisioning profile, we need the active developer's license and the UDID of the device. And we need internet connection. I will describe more why we need the, those things. So to allow the devices to run the developer signed code under the mandatory code signing policy of the iOS devices, Apple uses this provisioning profile. Basically, it binds a list of device to a certain developer's license and then it will be digitally signed by Apple to follow up the certificate, the trust chain. So existence of the provisioning profile means that Apple has allowed so to the certain developer, run their signed code on specified devices. So for example, the, in my iPhone, which is used for the iOS app development, it has a the bunch of the provisioning profiles and it is also signed by Apple. And only after installing those provisioning profile, I can run my application on the device. And in the provisioning profile, devices are registered with the UDID. So that's why we need to grab the UDID at the first stage. And the registration of the device is, uh, can be done through the developers portal, uh, developers.apple.com website. So Mactans needs the internet connection to get this file, uh, to generate this file and get this signed by Apple. However, we believe that it is not that hard to get an internet connection for a charger like a Mactens. For example, if there's a free Wi-Fi connection, Mactens can use it, or if there's a weak keyed, the encrypted connection, then Mactens can hack it, or the, with the advanced system on chip technology, we can ship with the SIM card, Mactens, uh, we can ship Mactens with the SIM card, then the, it, it can use the, it can freely use the cellular network connection, which is available anywhere in these days. And with the available internet connection, getting up this provisioning profile can easily be automated. And let's see how, what is the common way to get the provisioning profile. Uh, I found this uh, question and answer on the Stack Overflow, which is the well-known developers community. And the one guy is asking about, uh, he has the device and have the UDID, but uh, he don't have the physical access to the device and he need to uh, get the provisioning profile. And the answer is, log on to the provisioning portal and type some UDID and select something and click, click and click generate. So it just requires uh, the log on credential and typing UDID and few clicks and it can be easily automated by the browser automated 
automating tools. So we use the Selenium, which is well known, and it's really easy. And once the provisioning profile is obtained, then it can be installed through the connection that we established uh, at the prior pairing step. And during the installation, I devices do not ask about the, the user's permission for installing, or it does not give any visual indication when it is uh, installing on the device. And also, after installing the provisioning profile, now we can inject arbitrary app that is signed by our own developer's license. And also, on installing, uh, the installing application, it does not ask user for installing permission. However, unlike with the jailbreak attack, MacTan's attack do not give the root privilege. So if we install the application on the device, then it will be shown on the springboard, which is the main screen of the iOS devices, and it is still under the sandbox protection, so it has a runtime limitation. So to make this MacTan's attack to be meaningful or, and it, to be stealthy, we need to go to the, some further steps like uh, hide the app to prevent unwanted deletion, and we need to circumvent uh, runtime restrictions. Let's start with the hiding an app. Uh, for hiding an app, actually, there, exist, uh, there already exist uh, some hidden apps on every stock i devices. So for example, the demo app.app and field test.app it is already existing on the iOS devices, but user might not see it. Because, uh, so, <coughs> excuse me, yeah. So we look into the, the common things of those apps, and we look into the, some metadata, which called the uh, info.plist, and there is the key SB app tags and value hidden. By setting this property as a hidden, it will make the app will not shown on the springboard and it will not shown on the task manager too. So user might not see the, our injected app if we set this flex. And another uh, to completely hide the app, we need to hide the execution too. So many people believe that the, in the iOS devices there is no the background survey service available. However, that's not true. And in default, Apple allows 10 minute limits for the background service for every application. 10 minute limit can be the short, but by searching for, for the developers community for a short time, I found a too easy way to uh, circumvent this limitation. So one way is if we terminate background execution before reaching the 10 minute limit and spawn the background thread again, then iOS framework will extend the limit to the another 10 minutes. Or if we set our app as a VOIP application, then we can set a callback function called the set keep alive timeout. And if we set it as a 600 second, which is 10 minutes, and it will be called every 10 minutes, then we can spawn a new background thread again and again. With this method, we, we can make our app can run indefinitely on the device. Now we can hide the app and the execution. Then what hidden app can do? So unlike with the jailbreak attack, we do not have the root privilege and we are still under the sandbox. But there is a one advantage we can take. It. That is, we can freely call the private API. A uh, private API is an uh, undocumented API on the iOS framework, and calling up this prohibited through the Apple's review process. However, in the MacTense attack, there is no such limitation because uh, there is no review process. We are just injecting our app through the USB communication. Yeah. So we found that two interesting things on the uh, on exploiting private API. And one thing is uh, taking a screenshot. By running this code on the screen, the, a background thread can take a screenshot of the current foreground window. And as everybody knows, in the iOS framework, whenever a user types a password on the password form, it will show the last character 
user typed in for verify their typing. So if we take a screenshot, whenever touch comes in, then our app can steal the password, char uh, password by character by character. Yeah. And another interesting thing is that the screenshot is a passive attack. For an active attack, we can actually simulate the touch and the physical button press event. It is actually intended for the Xcode for uh, their, the, for the developers to do some the automated user testing. And it, uh, this capability is uh, stored at the UI automation framework, which is on the developer's disk, and that is shipped with the Xcode. But if we, if we just grab that UI automation framework file and ship, ship it to the, our, our payload application, then we can simulate the touch without the Xcode. So there are a list of the APIs, available APIs, and there is a send tab and some point, so we can actually the, generate the touch event at the screen coordinate, or it has uh, the click lock, click menu, and click volume up, so we can also click the physical button press event. So previously from the screenshot, we have the eye of the user, and with the touch event, we have the hand of the user, so our hidden app can everything what user can do. Now we install the app, and we know what to do. Then how can we ex execute this uh, payload at the first time? So we introduce a method to make it as a Trojan. So instead of hiding our payload app, we decided to hide some famous and frequent, frequently learning and already existing on the target device. For example, Facebook or Skype. So at first time, first time of the tag, we removed the existing Facebook application on the device. And we repackaged the Facebook application with the SB attack hidden flag and installed it to the device. Then that original Facebook application will be installed but will not be shown anywhere on the user's device. And then we make our payload set name as a Facebook and we extract the icon from the Facebook and wrap it to the, our payload. Then user will see same icon, same name as a Facebook, but user will execute our payload. So the workflow of the Trojan horse is follows. So on the leftmost uh, figure, there's a Facebook application. So there's no visual difference with the original Facebook application, but it is actually a Trojan. And whenever a user launches it, our Trojan comes up and it will immediately call the original Facebook application through the custom URL, the API, which is provided by the iOS app framework. And then original, original Facebook application comes to front and finally user will see the Facebook application. So user will have no suspicions while the Trojan is executing on the background. And we prepared the, the video clip for showing the whole step of the MacDance attack. So let's, let's watch it. So this is a MacDance charger. Uh, it is uh, built with the Beagle board and we made some the fancy case with the 3D printer. Yeah, it has a power cable and SD card for operating system and some data and there is a lightning cable which will be connected to the iPhone devices. Yeah. And then there is an iPhone device and we reset this device to the factory state and just set the passcode. And let's look, uh, so there is no installed application and let's look into the device information. So version of the operating system is 6.1.4, so it is not a jailbroken device, and there is no pre-installed provisioning profiles. So it is a pristine stay state and just set it with the passcode. 
And to simulate the scenario, we will install the Facebook application from the App Store. And it is the uh, original Facebook application. So it is downloading and installing the Facebook app. Now it takes a long time. <laughs> yeah, now it is installed and executed. And it's just an original Facebook application. Yeah. So user can log in and use the Facebook. There's no Trojan at this time. Yeah, and let's start. So usually we'll see that the, there's a low battery and he will decide to charge with magnets, which is a bad choice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now connect with the USB cable. Yeah, it is charging. And at this time, the pairing cannot be happened because uh, it is passcode locked. But if the user got some SMS message or if user wants to do web surfing while charging, user will unlock the phone. Then Mac 10's attack can start it at this point. Since the paired connection can be permanently available whether or not the device is locked, the Mac 10's attack can, can launch, uh, can continuously launch if, even though the device is locked. And while Macton's installing the provisioning profile and the application, there is no visual indication of the installing. Yeah. So it is look like it's just a regular charging. Yeah. And for the whole process of the attack, uh, it takes a, uh, it generally takes a less than one minute. Uh, but uh, in this case, since the Facebook app is quite large, you saw that the installing from the App Store takes a long time. So installation of the Facebook takes like a 40 to 50 second, and install of the payload takes, takes a five to 10 second. So the overall, so the installing of the, the whole step uh, takes around 80 second. So the, we will open up the target iPhone after the 80 seconds has been passed. So. Yeah, let's try to open the iPhone. So unplug it and unlock the phone. And then there is no difference. Attack has happened, but user might not feel like there is any differences because that payload is actually the same as the Facebook application. So firstly, it launches Trojan and it launches Facebook application. Yeah. Uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. And since the original Facebook application is hidden on the task manager, there's only one Facebook application is shown, and it is actually Trojan. And original Facebook application is not on the springboard, and it is not on the, the task manager too. Yeah. And we set the payload to do something after user locks the screen. And let's see what will be happen. Yeah. So there's a no hand at all. It unlocks, types a passcode. Yeah. <laughs> and it will make a phone call to the, the phone right next to them. Yeah. A typing is a phone number, calling. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, actually phone rings. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is Macten's attack. Yeah. And I will pass the mic to the Billy to sum up the attacks, uh, the talking about the attack scenarios. So 
Um, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, after you've seen uh, how Mactons can take place in real life, uh, let's discuss about some attack scenarios. Um, so, we can think about uh, the deployment of Mactons in a very general uh, setting, uh, especially in uh, public spaces like airports or libraries. I'm sure you've seen these uh, USB outlets in airports and uh, for those who are staying in the uh, conference hotel, I'm sure that you've also noticed that um, there's, they also provide these uh, USB outlets to charge. Uh, so these are actually very, the prime uh, targets that uh, adversary can deploy uh, Mactons. Uh, and then, uh, so the first case is for a general purpose, uh, casting a wide net. Uh, in a second scenario, um, it's more of a targeted attack where um, I want to put, put into perspective scenarios like um, espionage, where the adversary is uh, very highly funded, um, uh, probably at a state level. So there's no question of the ability to be able to fabricate uh, the charger that looks exactly the same, feels way exactly the same, but it's actually a Mactens charger uh, capable of injecting uh, arbitrary malicious apps that you have seen just now. So uh, from, the, from the adversary standpoint, uh, he or she just needs to exchange the original charger with the Mactens charger, and then after that, the game is over. So for further discussions, uh, I will now pass the time to Cheng Yu. Okay, now let's discuss uh, some problems we found during this research and some uh, proposed uh, potential countermeasures. So problem number one, uh, incorrect trust model for pairing. So the current trust model used by iOS is that uh, any host is implicitly trusted if the device is not passcode locked. However, uh, as we have shown in, the, in our tech, the host can be malicious. It can be a Mac 10 charger or simply be a PC or Mac infected with malware that also can infect iOS device. And a minor problem with pairing, is, uh, as we already mentioned, is once the pairing is done, it's permanent. So um, more specifically, after the key exchange has uh, finished, the host can continue talking to the device even if the device is passcode locked again. This can be dangerous in two ways. First, it only requires one very quick unlock during the charger for a malicious host to compromise the device, as we have demonstrated. And second, if the private key associated, associated with uh, the trusted certificate that a device already accepts, is stolen by attacker. The attacker can reuse its priority to communicate with the device without further pairing. So to fix the, this problem, we propose the device should explicitly ask a user to authorize the pairing. In fact, after we report this weakness to Apple, Apple invited us to uh, evaluate what has become the uh, new iOS 7 Beta 2. And during the examination, we noticed Apple has added a new feature, that is when you connect the device to a new host, iOS 7 will pop up window and ask the user whether this host is trusted or not. And to fix the permanent pairing problem, we suggest all mobile operating systems should add some kind of uh, management functionality to allow users to manage trusted hosts. They can be uh, in a similar form uh, in the desktop OS, like managing your Wi-Fi connections. So problem number two, there's no visual difference for different connection states. In fact, there is only one uh, notification icon for iOS now, and it's uh, for synchronization. So it will only show up when you are doing backup and restore. It will not show up when Mactens tries to install the provisioning profile. It will not show up when it tries to install the Trojan app. And it will not show up when we try to do some debugging. So this is the primary reason why our tech is very stealthy. So the fix for problem number two, we, we suggest adding more indicate uh, to, sorry, we suggest we adding more uh, notification to indicate what is happening on the device. Note, uh, the fix for problem number one already partially fixed the problem because right now if you plug an iOS 7 device into Mactens charger, you will immediately notice there's something wrong because a charger should never ask for pairing. But as the host can also be PC, this does, this does not solve the whole problem. 
So we suggest, uh, for example, could add in uh, different icons for different connection states, one for synchronization, one for app installation, and one for debugging. And uh, it would also be better to include uh, some mechanisms similar to Android. Uh, well, when you have a new installed app or updating a new uh, app, there will be a notification in the notification center telling what has happened. So problem number three, uh, provisioning profile abusing. So while uh, each app has to go through a very strict review process to get signed, the uh, provisioning profile signing functionality is not well guarded. For this reason, marketing charging can automatically generate a provisioning profile for the target device on the fly. So to fix this problem, we suggest adding uh, additional procedures to stop uh, this kind of uh, abusing. For example, a kept chart can be added to stop uh, automatic, uh, automatic provisioning profile generation and the better uh, um, abnormal detection uh, mechanism can be deployed to detect suspicious behavior such as adding large amount of UDID to a provisioning profile. Although this cannot uh, prevent targeted attack, we think it can be helpful to stop large scale malware infection. Problem number four, overprivileged default capability for USB. So as we already mentioned, the USB can be used to obtain the device information. It can be also used to install and remove apps and uh, provisioning profiles. It can be used to perform backup and restore, and even from our reset, it is also used uh, for debugging. So among these capabilities, we think uh, those two related to development, namely uh, installing the provisioning profile and uh, debugging is the most dangerous one because uh, without the ability to automatically install the provisioning profile, our attack won't succeed. And with the capability of debugging, you guys can come up with uh, all different kinds of creative uh, attacks. So to fix this problem, we suggest reducing the default capability of uh, USB. For example, installing the provisioning profile should ask the user for authorize. This can be uh, done similar to how you uh, ask the user to whether to trust the host or not for pairing. And uh, the debug mode should never be able to turn down through USB. So in fact, Android does a better job in this scenario because to turn on the debug mode on Android phone, the developer has to manually touch the uh, virtual information seven times before the uh, menu even shows up. So problem number five, the hidden app property. So during our research, we found this uh, property is only used by a few apps uh, uh, of Apple's own or maybe from the carrier. So we think it's of uh, uh, few or non-legitimate use for third-party apps, and but it has very high abuse potential. And the fix for this problem can be easy. Apple can make this uh, an entitlement and restrict it to uh, be used by Apple's own app, similar to how Apple restricts the code, code generation and entitlements to mobile Safari only. So before ending, one more thing. In this talk, we have demonstrated how we can leverage the USB pro protocol and uh, the personal developing account to inject malware into any iDevice. However, this is not the only way. In the coming USNIC security conference, our colleague will present how a malicious app can bypass app review process and get distributed through the uh, official app store. Thank you. Please fill up your uh, feedback form. Your feedback is very important to us. And then uh, we raise the question of other ways to basically challenge this security assumption uh, besides jailbreaking the devices. So I want to, you to uh, keep in mind these questions and hopefully you'll find uh, the answers to these uh, by the end of uh, these questions by the end of our talk. So we begin our analysis from the uh, Apple App Store. The Apple App Store uh, in a nutshell is a very critical piece in this whole ecosystem on iOS security. And the reason is that it helps Apple to enforce this uh, model called the World Garden model. Basically, what this model means is that uh, no arbitrary person should be able to install arbitrary app on any arbitrary iDevice. 
So in this context, Apple App Store is very important from the developer's point of view. It is the platform, the only platform to publish apps. And from the user's point of view, it is the only place to purchase or download apps. Now, needless to say, this Apple App Store is completely owned and controlled by Apple. Therefore, the integrity during the app review process uh, should not come as a question. Now, all apps that are submitted must be reviewed by Apple prior to release. Uh, but the caveat is that even though the app may have gone through and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's one of you, it's wonderful to be here today. My name is Billy Lau. I am a research scientist from Georgia Institute of Technology. Um, today, together with my colleagues, uh, Yongjing Zhang and Cheng Yu Song, uh, we are going to be presenting our work entitled Mactons Injecting Malware into iOS Devices via Malicious Chargers. So Mactons is basically uh, encapsulates a, a small portion of our findings in a larger security research uh, in mo mobiles, uh, mobile security research that is done in Georgia Tech Information Security Center, uh, better known as GTIS. So why don't we get started? Um, here is the agenda for today. Basically, the talk will be partitioned into three sections, uh, beginning with the uh, iOS security. In this section, I will talk about the overview of iOS security and uh, a deeper analysis of what it is. And then we will go into the introduction of Mactons, that is a proof of concept attack that we've developed, which um, allows us to basically install these malicious applications. And then we'll end with discussions uh, beginning from the observations that we've made during the process of research and also the uh, potential uh, who can actually sign uh, apps is the iOS developers themselves. Now, then who can become iOS developers? Again, uh, during our process, uh, research process, uh, what we did was we go to the um, Apple's development portal uh, and uh, request to be developers. We submit our credentials, names, address, and credit card numbers, and we will be billed, uh, I think it's $99, and then um, a few hours after that, we approve, and voila, uh, I'm already an iOS developer. So this, what this means as, as a consequence is that now I am able to uh, sign any arbitrary app and then run arbitrary app on any iDevice. So I want you to first keep in mind of this point as we continue to review the uh, Apple World Garden model. So uh, conventionally, uh, when a developer is done developing his app, he will submit it to the App Store and goes through a uh, review process. During this review process, uh, Apple will attempt to uh, determine whether or not this app uh, pass or fail based on many, many criteria, uh, uh, rules, and regulations. Uh, naturally, the question is what are then, what then are the rules? Show countermeasures that we have proposed and also what we have seen implemented, uh, uh, what countermeasures that we have seen implemented uh, in the newest release of uh, iOS 7 beta. So now uh, to begin, uh, let's start with the I overview of an iOS security. Now, um, before I go further, um, let me get uh, started with a few terms that I'll be using throughout. So I'll be using, number one, the term apps uh, to refer to applications, uh, programs that users install on their um, iPhones or iDevices. And as I mentioned, iDevices, I will, I will be using this term instead of uh, particularly um, iPhones or iPad because it's a more general term. Now, in the research of iOS security, um, we deal with a lot of assumptions and basically challenging these assumptions as we find them. And here the question today is how secure are uh, iOS devices? And how do we relate these assumptions to uh, everyday user? In particular, um, like activities like um, answering the phones, uh, making calls or sending SMSs to very mundane activities like uh, even charging their phone, which every user must do, we presume initial release uh, approved for release, it could still be removed from the store retroactively should Apple find uh, this app to violate its policy sometime in the future. Now with this, uh, we raise another question. 
the question is then how does Apple enforce this policy that no arbitrary person should be able to download an arbitrary app and run it? What if me as a user, I want to uh, download an app and run it? Uh, the simple answer to that is through something called uh, the mandatory code signing process. Basically, the code signing process enforces the integrity all the way from the hardware, uh, the, the device itself, to uh, going up in, uh, in, in the software stack, uh, to the bootloader, the operating systems, and eventually the apps. Um, basically, so this means that only apps that are, uh, have dig correct digital signature can be installed and executed on iDevices. Who can, now the question, who can sign this apps? Uh, no doubt, of course, only Apple can sign this. But um, during our uh, process of research, we discover that there is a potential channel which uh, can be exploited, and this is the other entity that 